Matt Jaskell in Las Vegas. Thanks for joining us on Air Sports News. Man, hey, thanks so much for having me. Are you from it? Are you from Las Vegas? You know, I, you know, essentially, you know, people would call me, I would call myself a, uh, a local after 30 plus years, but I was actually born in California, kind of like near Santa Monica. Uh, and then when I was five years old, moved to Vegas. Well, air sports, relatively new to skydiving. What is it, four or five years you've been jumping out of planes? Just September was just six years that I started skydiving. Oh, six years. It's a little bit longer. How many jumps have you done now? Uh, over, you know what? When you start working a little bit, you know, I, I wouldn't, I would call it a semi profession, more of a side weekend hobby, but uh, over 15, 16, you know, about 1,600 jumps probably now. Yeah. What are you doing? What work jumps are you doing? What? Uh, so doing some outside video stuff uh, here in Vegas, which I really enjoy doing. It's kind of a passion of mine. Just I love, you know, I, I fell in love with the sport like most others do for, for very similar reasons why a lot of other people get into sport. And uh, yeah, filming people and, and being able to share that with them and see their, you know, see their experience. I actually got my tandem rating a year ago. Didn't even tell anybody, but I'm scared to do tandem still. Here, and, and honestly, here in Vegas, the weather can be up and down as we were just uh, just kind of talking about this morning before we started this. Yeah. Um, you know, it'll be 100 degrees, you know, plus 120 Fahrenheit in the summer and then cold in the winter. And so, yeah, we'll see. I'm, I might try to get back on doing a few tandems this, uh, this year, so. Yeah, I got kind of forced into doing my tandem rating a while ago when I was in Spain, I ended up doing a thousand tandems, but I didn't really like it. It wasn't really for me. Okay. Yeah. See, and I don't know yet. I mean, I think I, I yeah, I just, I don't know. I, 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 um, I think it's a good thing, right? Healthy respect. I get scared. It's, it, you know, when I did a few of them, I was like, okay, this is fun. But when, but I guess also when you're working at a drop zone, you know, you know, more often than most, at least for me, like working weekends, doing a lot of jobs and you see, you know, the, the just craziness and the hustle and, you know, the things that can go wrong. I'm just like, man, I don't, I don't know. You know, I'm filming the, the I'm filming t tandem instructors that are far better and more badass than I ever will be. You know, these guys, 15,000 tandems and they're struggling with a guy that's fumbling around. And I'm like, I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> I don't maybe know you need to go for it. But if you don't, maybe take your time. Which drop zone are you working up? So, uh, so here in Vegas, uh, really cool. We have Go Jump. So, uh, if you know Mike Vetter, uh, yeah. who you know who started, you know who uh, actually it's great. You know Rich Grimm started, you know, uh, you know the the drop zone in Oceanside, California. Rich Grimm brought it, uh, bought it. So, uh, a guy named um, Eddie Carroll, who's a military guy. You know, a lot oh, of people Eddie. know him. Yep. So Eddie, Eddie was, uh, you know, it's funny, interesting guy. But he was, you know, he was good to me. He was. Um, he was kind of a mentor, obviously. He owned the drop zone here in Vegas where I learned and learned by, uh, I was trained by a guy named Mike, uh, by uh, Jace Ramsey. And then, so Eddie, you know, was was the owner. And then just about two years ago now, uh, Mike Vetter bought out uh, Eddie Carroll and now it's Go Jump here in Vegas. So I'm really interested uh, in your history, Matt, with your racing driving, because you've raced professionally, you've coached, uh, stunt driving as well over many, many years. And I want to talk a bit about that, but what I'm interested yeah. in an overview is how you view skydiving, the marketing of skydiving and other air sports as well, compared to what you've seen in big budget car racing. Yeah, well, gosh, man, it is uh, in a, a crazy life story, you know, and we don't even have enough time to tell it all for sure, you know, and, it, and it, it's even a bit emotional at times because you know the reason why I started and, and everything and and people there's definitely a misconception about motorsports you know some people understand some people don't of just how political it is how money driven how traumatic it can be you know it's it's um it is a very tough not pretty sport you know if anybody's even watched um that the Formula One documentary on you know on um on Netflix that gives you some idea there's also a show on Netflix called The Gentleman Driver you know about how you know that how how the world of racing has changed especially in sports car racing you know where, where drivers are bringing money to, to race and it was always like that even when i was around but to try to give you an overview you know yeah and and a basic where i came from i, I started motorsports when i was very young obviously you know i was i was racing motocross at the age of five yeah. um I, before i was out of motocross you know i was racing at the track with guys like travis pastrana and bubba stewart james stewart you know some of the most famous you know dirt bike riders around and uh, I got out of motocross, um, got into kart racing, um, you know, and just, again, make a long story long. Fast forward, you know, kart racing at the age of 10. By the time I was 14, I was I was winning big championships and I was scouted 
by a world famous indie car driver by the name of Paul Tracy, a Canadian uh, who who had ran in Formula One. And at the time, you know, racing in the late 90s, early 2000s was as big as bigger than it will ever even be today. I mean, as far as the money, the funding, I mean, drivers were making millions of dollars. There was just huge, you know, this is when you had Marlboro and, and player cigarettes and cool yeah. cigarettes. You just had some of the biggest brands in the world backing motorsports and and uh, so Paul Tracy was a uh, one of the most famous drivers in motorsports, mostly because of um, uh, he, a lot of uh, I would actually say not not always good things. To be honest, he he was uh, uh, polit or controversial to say the to say the least. You know, like crashing his teammates and things like that. But he was extremely fast. Uh, he lived here in Las Vegas, and he scouted me, and so I raced for Paul Tracy when I was only a teenager, and that kind of elevated my my racing career. And then I got scholarships through motorsports and uh, and then I got scouted by Red Bull for, you know, what was, you know, what was one of the highest honors in America at the time. It was the Formula One development program um, for Americans, which, you know, out of millions of Americans and, and millions of drivers, uh, there was literally four of us that were signed to a contract. I was teammates with Scott Speed. Um, so as far as Americans, there was only four American Red Bull development Formula One drivers. Uh, when I was sent over to Europe to live at the headquarters and to train before I would eventually start racing, which I ended up racing in like uh, junior Formula One, Formula like Formula Three. I was racing Formula BMW. What, something amazing, very cool story for Formula One fans. My teammate, or, and we never raced against each other because I was racing in a different series than he was, but we lived together for a short time. Was uh, was um, Sebastian Vettel? Really. So, yeah, man, he was my roommate. And what's kind of funny is uh, I, I hate going back and it's, it's crazy how much life has gone by already. But I was only 18, barely going on 19. He was 16 going on 17. And, uh, you know, this was way before he was a Formula One world champion, but he wasn't old enough to drive in Europe. So when I so when I got to Austria, uh, that's where the Red Bull headquarters are. Um, the, the the number two in charge, who's still at Red Bull today, Thomas Uberall, he hands me the keys to the to the athlete car. And he goes, ah, since you're here early, I, I got there like a week early than I was supposed to be because I wanted to get there before all, the, all my American teammates and like make, you know, make friends. Very, again, very cutthroat, very political. So I changed my flights that Red Bull gave me. I got there earlier than my teammates. And uh, they said, oh, you and Sebastian are about the same age. So we're going to put you in the same apartment together. And uh, here's the keys of the car. You need to be at the gym every day at these times. And you have to drive because Sebastian wasn't old enough to drive in Europe. So I drove us to the gym every morning. Uh, had dinner at his parents' house. You know, we'd, we'd go karting on our days off when we weren't training. And, and uh, yeah, man, that was pretty amazing. He was a really cool dude. And so to um, to have that story was, it was pretty cool to me. And uh, yeah, so, you know, I did the Formula One, uh, you know, Formula One search. And then that's when things get tough, man. Like, you know, I, you know, living the rock star life and so, so to speak, but it was very difficult. It was very... Um, very political again like i said very stressful not as fun as people would think and um i lost my ride you know and, and it wasn't for any other reason other than very political and financial you know and so uh so after after a season i, I lose my ride with red bull and then you know just like most race car drivers i was struggling to get a ride and and i, I was making my way i was able to recover and get into a seat and win a championship in a different series and then started doing some nascar stock car racing and then you fast forward to 2008 and the, the world economic collapse, you know, and that forced a lot of drivers into uh, retirement, so to speak, even if it wasn't by choice, you know. So in, in 2008, I stopped racing full time. And to kind of go on about what you said is that's how most race car drivers, if you can't get paid, if you're not making a living driving a race car, you're working at a racing school, you're working as a racing driver, you're you're trying to get stunt driving gigs or whatever you can do to get paid to be behind the wheel, you know? And so, but even at a younger age, even at the age of 16 years old, I was working at a kart racing school as a as the chief instructor. It's how I met one of, you know, one of my, you know, cool stories that, that's meaningful to me, obviously, is when I was only 16 years old, I, I was coaching and working at a racing school, a, a pretty big one in Las Vegas at a, at a kart racing school. Yeah. And I met Alexander Rossi. So I meet Alexander Rossi, who, for those that don't know, he was the um, the 2016 Indy 500 champion, and he won the 100th running of the Indy 500. So it was the one to win for sure. Right. And uh, I actually met him when he was only eight, and I trained him for four days. I did a four-day racing school with him. He had never touched a steering wheel, so I taught him how to drive. 
Uh, and then throughout the years, I mentored him on and off, like just mentoring him where, you know, where to go race, what team to be with, you know, his fa I would talk to his father and, you know, kind of guide him and things like that. And then Alex was off. He went to, he went to Europe. He ended up making it to Formula One briefly and then came to America to race IndyCar. I had lost touch with him over the years. I showed up to the, um, the, the hundredth running of the Indy 500 just to see friends and be there. And, and I end up uh, kind of reconnecting with he and his father before the race and we're hanging out and he wins the Indy 500. So, I mean, it was emotional. It was, the, it was probably the first time in my life I cried for another driver winning a race. You know, it was, it was, it was pretty emotional. And um, so that was, yeah, that was in 2016. So, yeah, I've been coaching and training and, and teaching, you know, lots of drivers for many years. And, and I still race, luckily, part time here and there and get into a few professional rides, especially like endurance sports car racing, you know, 24 hour races and things like that. And uh, in 2014 is, you know, I was struggling in life with happiness, to be honest. I was working at a racing school and as cool as that sounds to people, it's not where I want to be. You know, a, a good example to try to explain to people is imagine being a, a fit, you know, baseball player. You're, you're still good. You can still hit a, you know, you can still throw a 90 mile an hour fastball. You can still hit it out of the park, but you're working at a batting cage. You know, yeah, there's worse things to be doing, but it's not what you want to be doing. And that's kind of whether it's a bad analogy or not, it's what I related working at a racing school. You know, it's like, it's not what I, what I trained my whole life to be doing. It's not what I wanted to be doing. And, uh, and skydiving genuinely, just like a lot of people and as cliche as it might sound, it filled a void in my life. You know, it was just, and I found it and it was intricate. It was something, you know, you had to learn. It was difficult and, and, um, and it changed, and it, you know, changed my life like it does many others. And it you found yourself then putting all your energy into skydiving as you are now, you know, you're working your way up into being almost full-time in the sport. Is that the way? Yeah, you know, and I don't even know if I want to be full-time. And again, you know, my story is long and, and what happened was 2014, I start skydiving and I was still trying to go racing. I was still working on deals like, like a lot of other drivers. And, uh, and then in 2015, my father had a heart attack. Uh, he survived. He had open heart surgery, triple bypass. And that was obviously, you know, one of the biggest fears of my life, right? He's the, the most important man in my life and he's responsible for everything I am today, aside from my mother. And, and uh, he had a heart attack, uh, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't, um, uh, it was more serious than you would think. It wasn't like, oh, he went in and got checked and, you know, he had a heart attack, almost died. And then, you know, didn't even know if he could, if they could do the surgery on him. And he had a business, nothing, you know, it's like, I don't come from money as, as most, as a lot of people think because of, you know, skydiving adventures and travel, you know, there's that misconception. I don't come from money it, you know, up until a couple of years ago, I was living in a foreclosed home all the way dating back to the economic collapse and trying to take care of my parents and my family. I have debt, you know, I, so a lot of times going on these skydive adventures, they're, they're a lot less expensive than people think. And I finance it, you know, I'm like, oh, I don't want to miss, miss this opportunity. Let me, let me pay for it on a credit card. Um, I'm very open, very transparent. So I was just grinding away, man. I was work, I was making a good living, but I was just working my ass off, you know, driving schools, working for Bridgestone, Teens Drive Smart programs, you know, trying to race a couple times a year, just, just, you know, working. And I, and I never even really saw my dad, but he ran a hardwood flooring business. You know, it's what, it's what took care of the family. It's what allowed me to go racing when I was a young man. Uh, and when he had his heart attack, the business, he had had it for 40 years, the business was gonna go belly up. And, and, and it was already in not good shape. You know, he wasn't pay, taking care of vendors and paying bills and he wasn't collecting money. And, you know, he was just getting older and couldn't keep up with it. And when I, I left my job at Dream Racing here in Las Vegas, where I was the chief instructor at a racing school, and and took over the family business, so to speak. And, uh, and that was a journey, you know, that that's now five years. It's been a journey of balancing, taking care of life, taking care of my family, trying to make sure my dad's business stays alive. That helps pay bills and mortgages and my mom. And, yeah. and, um, and then I was still skydiving, you know, I, and, and that was my, and what was amazing was my family supported it. Nobody sees, you know, I only post the good stuff on Facebook and Instagram, as we all know. Nobody saw the the 2 a.m., you know, waking up at six in the morning, back at the shop, managing employees, you know, drama, bills, you know, yeah. judgments, people coming after us for money because bills weren't paid. Like nobody see that stuff. But I would work my ass off for, for weeks, months at a time. And then I'd go on a week adventure to go skydive to keep my sanity, you know, and and, and, and do something that that fulfilled me since I wasn't doing anything else other than working all the time you know so that's actually what the last five years have been like and and there's been some amazing times and i 
and I definitely, the good outweighs the bad in my opinion. I mean, I, it's been a, a tough journey taking care of my mother and my father and, and, um, and myself and, and trying to be successful and still do what makes me happy. But that's, that's what it's been like for five years is, and then working towards, yeah, I don't know if necessarily full time in the sport, but it definitely still fulfills me. I love aerial sports. I was actually flying. I, I was getting my pilot's license before I became a skydiver. I've always loved aviation and travel and flying. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely think that, you know, skydiving will be something even more. Like I said, I tell people now that it's a semi-profession, but now, you know, I've, I've actually sold my father's business. I have about a year left to help manage it. And then in, in the next 12 months, I need to kind of figure out what's the next move, you know? And uh, if I can balance still doing what I'm good at, which is car related, motorsports, automotive, and skydiving, I, I think that'd be a pretty amazing life, you know? Yeah. Oh, interesting stuff, Mark, really is. I mean, with your history in the car racing and seeing how it is there with the pressure and with the money and with the, the professionalism which is pumped into it, are you keeping an eye on what's happening with drone racing? Because they're getting big sponsorship now and they're going down that route and you've got these young athletes, these young pilots that are on tour at the moment virtually. You can, obviously you're in a good place to see how that must be for them, the pressure they must be under. Yeah, you know, it's actually pretty amazing to see, and it's sad, I was just talking about this yesterday to some pretty you know, important people in the motorsports world, how, and listen, I think we have to, you know, talk about the the white elephant in the room, which is, um, it, what, you know, listen, I've been a race car driver my whole life, you know, and, and pretty pretty conservative type of person. But I think we can't ignore when you have major corporations like Honda and Bridgestone and things like that, that are pulling out of some motorsports. And a lot of it isn't money as much as it is ecological. Right. There, there, you know, the climate change discussion is getting heated, no pun intended, is, is, is going up there and, and things are shifting very quickly. And I see it happening in motorsports. Honda just announced they're pulling out of Formula One. That's kind of a big deal. Yeah. Mercedes pulled out of a DTM, the biggest sports car racing in the world. Uh, Bridgestone just pulled out of kart racing, which is one of the biggest sports in the world that Bridgestone supports. You're starting to see a shift. And now look at electric vehicles coming into the mix. Now you look at drone racing coming into the mix. Uh, it, you know, the, the, whether you love it or not, it's, ha it's here, the VR, virtual reality. I mean, it, it is here and there is the renewable energy sources. Um, I think you're gonna see a Tesla racing series here very soon because there's already been, already been talks about it. And then seeing the drone racing, man, that's something, you know, as far as the aerial sports, I've even said, I'm like, gosh, a lot of these hands-on type of people, pilots, drivers, they're going to be, they're always, they're always going to be needed, but it's going to be even more difficult for people coming up because it's going to be shifting to, to this other type of things, you know? And so you just mentioned drone racing again, that parallel for motorsports, the online, online racing, the sim, the sim racing is insane. It's huge right now. It's becoming such a big market where it's scary because in the next 10 years, uh, you know, Formula One might be playing second to online racing series, you know, no different than aerial sports to the VR and drone racing. It's crazy. I was interviewing a, a chap from one of the drone leagues a couple of weeks ago, and you would imagine like with skydiving competitions, with motorsports, you've got to do your apprenticeship, put the years in. They've got one guy there, he's in the top uh, three right now, and he picked up a drone for the first time eight months ago. And right. He See, that overtook a batch of people. He, the skill, the quickness of learning. I, I would say that, that it was, age, you know, when he's eleven or twelve or something. I, I and I will say that the VR world, you know, drone simulator racing, is going to be more competitive than even the real stuff, because there's, you know, anybody can do it. Anybody can get into it for relatively low cost. You know, I, one of my worst questions that you know it it crushes me at the at the same time. I'm I'm sick of hearing it over the last twenty five years. Hey man, how do I get into racing? Like, oh man, if I had a dollar for every time somebody asked me that, I'd be able to fund my racing career. You know, yeah. it's like, I'm like, well, go back, you know, 15 years, start when you're five, make sure you have a lot of money, go through a lot of hardship and spend a million dollars and there's still no guarantees. You know, so even though maybe getting into drone racing could be there's costs and everything to go even do what's insane, to go do this, to go do go-kart racing, which more every Formula One driver starts in. It's what you essentially have to start if you want to go racing. Yeah. To do a season, a full season of kart racing, 
I mean, Regan, we're talking 50, 60,000 US dollars. It's absurd. It's absolutely absurd. And if you're just starting out, you're going to spend three years learning how to be a fast driver. You know, you're, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter. There's no such thing. Even a Michael Schumacher gets on the scene. He's not winning a championship in his first year. You know, he's going to be, you know, progressing and learning where you can get into this, you know, VR stuff for a few thousand dollars, whether it's a simulator, whether it's the drone equipment. And if you have some talent, you're there, you know, and, and now you're competing. So it's it's going to be a different world here soon, man. Yeah, it really is. It really is. Are you going to be doing some jumps today? Do you think, Matt? You got some plans? Yeah, I think so. You know, uh, it's uh, it's it's going on. You know, it's not even nine a.m. here in Vegas. We uh, we you know, the shutdown has been you know crazy, but we're I think we're so lucky that skydiving is even allowed to be open. You know, I mean, we are doing it as responsibly as possible, and you know, we're doing temperature checks, and and you know, everybody's wearing masks and doing the part, but we still try to you know, everybody still needs to try to stay open and make a living and. Um, so we've, we've only been open four days a week. We're open, uh, you know, Thursdays through Monday, but you know, Friday, Saturday, Sunday's busy. So yeah, to, to even say I'm allowed to go skydiving is I'm grateful for that. And, and it's, you know, we've actually been pretty busy here in Vegas. We've been, been pretty happy and grateful, uh, to even have that. So yeah, probably go do some, even if we're a little slow today, I might put on a, um, my mutation, my, my, uh, you know, kind of like the wingsuit, you know, I haven't flown it yet and go do a few jumps. Randy, Randy Seib, uh, Randy Seib, he's, yeah, he's here in Vegas. So we're, we're talking about jumping today, doing, some, doing a few coach jumps. Fantastic. Well, listen, I'll let you go get some breakfast and try and hit that first load. Yeah, thanks, man. Is it now you've got, uh, is it nine o'clock your first load there? No, 10 actually. Perfect. That's oh. how this worked out great. So I'm going to yeah, have some breakfast myself. And then uh, it's about a 45 minute drive for me down south toward you get to leave Vegas and you drive towards California about 45 minutes. Yeah. Okay. Well, Matt, listen, it's been an absolute pleasure to catch up with you. It's been too long. Hope to get to see you in real life at some point. Yeah, one of these times I want to come back on and talk about you more, man. You're an interesting guy. Uh, <laughs> and, and I'd love to hear, I want to hear more. I follow you. I want to hear more about your life story, man. It's honestly, to, let me say this. It's been an honor to just know you um, and to, I mean, just to know your background and, and to spend some time with you and go to one of the coolest boogies in the world together. And so I'm grateful for that, man. And uh, thanks for even letting me share some of my story and, and talk on here, man. Ah, it's been great. It's been a good catch up. We'll, uh, we'll speak to you soon. You take care. All right. Thanks, sir.